and um, I have been debating for about four years now. I am also the president of KIDA, um, Kira, Korea, um, Korean Diversity Debating Association, and um, for the past couple of years, I've been mostly focused on judging. So those of you who have gone to most national tournaments would probably have seen me. Um, or if you have um, gone to international tournaments, you might have seen me as well. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the lecture. So I think for me, a couple of you might be wondering, why should I listen to a judging lecture? I didn't come here to judge, I came here to debate. But it's very important to know that adjudicators are important because in order for your speech to matter and or in order for you to advance further into tournament, there needs to be a good judge that's able to compare and evaluate your ranking within, a within that round, right? So I think that's why um, Kira as a community has to do a better job in raising not only qualified debaters but also qualified adjudicators who are able to make that right call and i think that a lot of very successful judges have also come from ads um, i've judged with Min before she is also a very good judge um, you guys have a lot of like very good top 10 ranked judges from knc or from other um very like national or international ranked um, um, tournaments as well. But I think also not only, even if you don't choose to adjudicate, it's very important for you to understand how, a, how an adjudicator's mind works because it helps you debate as well because it provides a different perspective for you to see that this is this is how the person is going to be judging me and if i'm able to understand how this person is judging me then i can then um perhaps be more persuasive when it comes to framing or when it comes to using all of the techniques that were taught to you by previous lecturers um i think it's also important to note that um in the second semester it's bp season and especially in bp um even for very good adjudicators they may sometimes be divided in the ranking, particularly in very close and competitive debates. Um, maybe you guys will have the chance to see the grand finals of the rookie tournament that happened yesterday. But even for that grand finals, there were seven very qualified judges and those judges were split um, a number of ways for which team was first. And they all had relatively good reasoning as to why they chose to support that team. It's just that an adjudicator then has to defend that team or push for them to go to advance or perhaps win the tournament. Um, yeah, so just to, I guess, summarize, this lecture is intended to do three things. It's first to minimize your subjectivity in regards to adjudication. Second, to clarify the defined rules of BP debate. In that, um, we want you guys to understand what other rules are and how you're able to do um, better when it comes to these kind of rules. Um, but third, we also want to um, help you guys bring consistency when it comes to um, understand when it comes to giving your adjudication. Because I think sometimes there are cases where a lot of um, judges can reach very good decisions. It's just that they aren't able to do it all the time. And it's especially important for you to do that because you should be able to make the right call all of the time and also be able to give justifications regarding that. Um, so these are the three things that I want to do. I guess the clarification regarding like what this lecture is supposed to do is um, there are good judges and I think good judges are very, very different in that even when it comes to judges like Chisong, who I really admire as a judge, we have very different judging standards or guidelines. So I think this is more of, this is not an absolute standard of judging debates. And I'm not saying that people that don't judge this way are wrong, but for people that are beginning to judge, I think this, if you follow the guidelines that I have set for you, it helps you to at least break. It helps you to at least make the right call most of the time. So that's what I hope is clear to you guys um, before I start this lecture. Yeah. So I think before we begin anything, when it comes to parliamentary judging, whether it be Asian parliamentary or British parliamentary, the most important thing for you to do is to be in the um, is to be in the role of an average reasonable person, meaning you as a person should be a fairly well informed citizen of the globe with an average understanding of global regional issues and a basic understanding of popular disciplines and logic. You should not be someone that is very, very informed when it comes to these issues. So for example, if I am, I am an econ major and I saw an economics motion, if I use 
the knowledge that I learned from my major classes or learned from like reading extensively um, magazines that are focused on, for focus on economics, then it's not an average well-informed citizen. That is a person that has a lot of information. But that does not mean that you cannot use that information that most people have or most, I guess, citizens or um, people have to determine false or I guess, like true information. So for example, if um, a debater comes up and says, no, Korea is not divided. Korea as of now is one country, then that is just factually wrong information, right? Because most citizens around the globe understand that Korea is divided into two. So it's things like this. You have to have an understanding of what is happening, but that cannot go beyond an extensive beyond to an extensive, extensive amount. Um, this also means that you should set aside personal preferences experience, opinions, or expert knowledge, in which means that if even if I have a certain political leaning, even if I have um, experience um, doing something somewhere else, that should not be the, the criteria for me deciding whether you win or lose in this round. Um, so another way we say this is you have to be a jack of all trades, a master of none, meaning that you should have equal amount or I guess like um, similar amount of basic knowledge in all fields but that or I guess like a basic preference but it shouldn't be something that is very very biased or very very personal um yes it's also important to note that you should try to judge the process of the argumentation meaning just because these this team or this person said this does not mean that this is an absolute argument and they should therefore win it is also a matter of how these speakers are able to develop that argument and deliver their argument as much as what they are arguing so the, i hope that is clear to you guys and i think honestly if you're able to do this this is i guess the basic step of judging before you guys do anything so I, that's why I think like with any judging lecture I have, I always try to make sure that people understand the concept of average reasonable person. Um, yes, I think it's also important for you guys to ask these questions in your head, or I guess like try to think of these questions and whether the um, person speaking at the podium has answered these questions. So when it comes to things like quality of the speech, how well developed is the argument? If the argument has a premise and layout and conclusion, do they fit all of these criteria or do we just jump to the conclusion? Things like this, right? Um, it's also important to understand, especially if you're the opening government, right? Um, if the team has a specific model in terms of what they were trying to state, what they're trying to explain and what they're trying to illustrate, right? Um, again, I'm pretty sure you guys have already had lectures about policy debates, right? So when it comes to a certain policy, how is this side going to push for it? Like what kind of picture is is, uh, opening government envisioning. But it's also important to note that teams have fiat in that if government is able to provide an understandable, it, uh, albeit not perfect, if it is a working model, then the opposition cannot simply tackle the grounds of feasibility and say that will never happen. Because again, debaters don't have a say in choosing the motion, right? So the motion is given to you guys, the sides are given to you guys. It's about how you're able to carry out that round. And if if teams are just fixated on whether or not this is going to happen, that's not the best use of the time in terms of talking about different um, impacts or clashes or principle or practical arguments. So just be careful of that in terms of, does Gov have a model? Does Gov also have fiat? And you also have to keep in mind that opposition that then also has fiat in that if government has a certain amount of capital or they're able to have a certain amount of resources, the opposition can also say that that same number of um, that same number of resources or capital exists on the R side of the house as well. It, then we don't want to have that policy. We would prefer to have an alternative, things like that. Um, it's also very important for you to look at the causal links of the arguments. As I said before, in regards to premises and conclusions, do they explain the step-by-step -step processes? And I think it's especially important for, I guess, like rookie debaters and rookie judges because we have a tendency or rookies have a tendency to just kind of jump to the conclusion straight away. But you have to lay out all the things as to how it's going to happen, why it's likely going to happen in order for you to reach that conclusion. Um, finally, logistical consistency. I'm going to be talking about knifing and contradictions a bit later in my slides, but be careful in terms of whether there is logical inconsistency, one, within a person's speech, but second, also um, between the two speakers. So if the speakers coming from closing government are clearly talking about two different things and they're lacking consistency, it's probably going to be difficult for you to credit their arguments to the fullest extent.
Um, yes, that's in terms of the quality of the arguments. It's also important for you to know the content of the arguments in that these are the questions that you should ask. Is this general knowledge an average personal person would know, or is it expert knowledge? For example, if government gives me statistical data and I, as an IR major, I, as a politics major, know that it's wrong, but other people probably wouldn't, then I would not credit it and say that, that it's wrong unless the other team points it out, right? Because, or if like two sides have, I guess, factual data or statistical data, and neither side is able to prove that they are right, but I know because of my studying or my research that one side is right, then I shouldn't say this person is right because I read this in a newspaper or whatnot. You should see the debate as is and try to see it as what happened. So in that case, that would probably be a deadlock in terms of data. So it would depend on which team is able to better explain why there's this more likely going to happen. Um, it's also important for you to understand that arguments and clashes are not equal when it comes to importance. So it's also important to note what clash eventually remains the most important inside this round. Um, also, it's also important to note how and why teams contribute to the most to this debate. So if OG says something and this argument continuously lasted throughout the debate and all opposition teams are trying to tackle this, then and probably the contribution is going to go to opening government. But if opening had a deadlock, but closing is the one that is able to solve the deadlock, then it's going to probably go to closing. So things like this, how are you able to change the scope of this, of this round and how are you able to contribute to winning are things that you should be asking as a judge. Um, yeah. I'm going to then move on to how teams win in BP. So for those of you who have gone to rounds or gone to tournaments, and you guys probably had heard, heard of this notion, right? So and it's different from Asian parliamentary that it's more than just two teams fighting. You have two teams within each side, and you're vying to be the best in those four teams. And what's going to happen is you're given a certain amount of points based on which ranking you receive. So if you are first, you receive three points. If you are second, you receive two points. If you are third, you receive one point. And finally, unfortunately, if you're coming last, you will receive no points. Um, this is a meme that I saw in like one of the Facebook groups, but basically it says, you get one point per team you beat. And um, the, the points that you receive are accumulated and that will determine your breaks. Um, for, the t for ADS1 that broke at SRT, you guys probably know how that system works. Um, for other rookies that are going to go to other tournaments or whatnot, um, that's why it's important for you guys to accumulate the points. But it's also, I guess, like less, um, well, getting a second or getting a third is less, I guess, um, critical to you compared to Asian parliamentary. So um, there's a joke that people say that as long as you come in second, you should be fine until the finals where you have to remain first. In that, the basic rule of thumb is you guys will break if you receive at least a second for all the rounds. That is a safe break. If you receive one point over that, that is a guaranteed break. If you receive one point lower that, that is going to be um, a break that is determined by speaker points. But again, this will differ that, like, according to how many participants you have. But that's a basic rule of thumb. Um, and um, judges are going to give the verdict in regards to which winning half there is. So if um, there are, if this round happened and OG was first and CG was second, then how the judge will give the verdict is, oh, I thought it was a government bench win, first going to opening government, second going to closing government, third going to closing opposition, fourth going to opening opposition. Or it could be the opposite, right? If opposition wins, then it's going to be an opposition bench win. Um, sometimes it happens that the first two teams or the last two teams are the win are the ones to win the round. In that case, it's going to be an opening bench win or a closing bench win. And for these cases, the judge will always say which team came in first and second. Um, but sometimes it's not always the case where two teams on the same side or two teams in the same opening or closing bench win. There may be cases in which opening government wins and closing opposition wins, right? We call that a lo long diagonal win because if you draw a square, um, if you draw a rectangle, I guess, that is the long diagonal in a rectangle, right? So if OG and CO come in first or second or second or first, then we call that a long diagonal round. If OO and CG come first or second or second or first, that is called a short diagonal win. So um, 
it's always, I think this is important for judges because it provides clarity as to how the debate proceeded, but also in terms of debaters, it's important for you to understand which team is the strongest in the round because then that allows you to um, compete against that team. So for example, if I am a closing team and if I'm closing government and clearly an opening half OG won over OO, there's no point in me trying to win OO because that at best I'm going to receive a third, third, right? Because OG is already over OO. In that case, what you should do is focus on competing against CO, the team that, that is left in the debate, but also, I guess, um, Competing with CG and telling a competing of OG and telling them what their extensions are or vice versa, right? If you are CO and you see that like your opening is not very good and the golf bench is very, very strong, then by winning over the golf bench, you're able to place first in the round. So that's how you should be able to compare yourself and have a more holistic understanding of what's happening in the round. Um, yeah. So I'm going to move on next to the criteria for judging. Um, there's no one clear standard when it comes to judging, and that's what I tell people is very important. So you should, as a judge, you should never say things like, oh, OG came first because of contribution. Oh, OO came second because of engagement. Because there's no one set criteria. It is always a holistic evaluation of what is happening. And these things include role fulfillment, engagement, contribution, quality and content of the arguments, as I've said before. So it's, I think it's very important for your judges to have an understanding of all of the things that one team did, not just one very good thing or one very bad thing. It's also important to apply the same criteria for all teams, because there are cases in which um, judges are good in having a holistic evaluation of the teams, but they are unfair to a certain team. So for example, if both OO and CO were not able to um, are not able to engage with opening government, then you cannot simply penalize OO but not penalize CO because CO also had a chance to compete with OO. But you should also note that OO cannot compete against the CG, right? So closing always has a bit more burden when it comes to engagement, just because they have a chance to listen to the entirety of the speech compared to opening where they're the only way that they can respond is through POIs and POIs always um, often more than not get rejected. Um, also, when it comes to things like if you're going to say that um, that one team in the opening house did not engage or one team in the opening house did not fulfill their role. Ask yourself, did the other team also not do this or were they able to do this, which is why they are clearly ahead of the other team. Um, yeah, it's also important to note that there is no such thing as an automatic fourth. So um, there was a round, I think yesterday, where um, opening government um, PM misread the motion or like they prepped the wrong side and that they realized that before or like um, after the before or during the speech. But what happened then is um, that does not mean that OG should get an automatic fourth. What happens still is up to the holistic evaluation of the round. So even if OG's first minute is wrong, then simply negate that part and listen to the other part that happened, right? So even if one team consistently refuses to give POIs, even if one team spoke for four minutes, that should not be the reason as to you not listening to the quality of the speech and just giving them a loss. Um, it's also important to note that you should not write down something that is said after seven minutes and 30 seconds. So um, you guys already know seven minutes is the speech like time of uh, is a time of one speech and there is a grace period of 30 seconds. But after that grace period, even if um, a speaker said a brilliant argument, you should not take that into consideration because that is clearly going against the rules of, of parliamentary debating. Um, this, again, translates into, if you're a debater, try to say the most important things first, because there are times, especially with rookie debaters, where you guys have really, really good extensions, but you focus so much on not very good rebuttals, but end up not having enough time to elaborate on your extensions. And that's when, when I give personal feedback. I tell a lot of rookie debaters, I think you should have focused on this part. That is the winning argument of your team. You should not focus on the other rebuttals that were not really that relevant. So um, this is what you should do when it comes to the criteria for judging. These are things where if you don't abide by these rules, you're probably not going to be a breaking judge or you're probably not going to receive a lot of positive feedback from the debaters. Um, so this is the basic of what you should do. Yeah, moving on to, so I said the criteria before was role 
fulfillment, engagement, and contribution. I'm going to go through these things one by one. So starting first with role fulfillment. Role fulfillment is very important in BP debate because there are four teams and the roles of these four teams are slightly different, right? I'm going to start with the opening half as to what their roles are. So the first team in a round, opening government, needs to provide a clear model of what is going to happen and have arguments whose impact last to the end of the round. Um, I think this is also like for me, I like opening government because opening government has a chance to frame the debate and provide a model that is slightly, I guess, like um, advantageous to your side. But I also know this is the reason why a lot of people don't like being opening government because models, I think, can be a bit difficult to do. Um, but opening government should be the one that provides a clear picture, a clear model of what's going to happen. In contrast, what should opening opposition do? They need to set up a convincing op case, a convincing first case for the opposition, and also de de defeat or provide doubt onto government's model. Because opening opposition is the first team that can attack opening government. After OO speech, OG's case should have some damage. And that's the case happening from the opening opposition. And it's also important for both openings um, to have arguments that are going to last throughout the round and to stay active for the rest of the round. Because um, granted, opening does not have a chance to give a speech, but they can still engage to closing by actively giving POIs or trying to accept POIs from closing or trying to preempt their arguments. So it's very important because even if you are the team that wins in opening half, if closing is the one that wins, then at best you're third. So these are things that role fulfillment you need to keep in mind in regards to what happens in the opening half. Um, I'm just going to go over this briefly. Hopefully you guys have had very good lectures from um, your seniors about BP case building and inter to BP rules. Um, but yeah, moving on to closing half, what should closing do? So CG needs to provide a clear extension that you decide is valid. So you as a judge decide is valid and improve the quality of or add new insight to the debate. I'm going to go a bit further into what counts as extension um, in, in the later slides. But at, so what CG needs to do is differentiate themselves from their opening half and also to add something that is able to provide to their contribution, whether it be rebuttals, whether it be um, framing, whether it be providing vertical or horizontal extensions. Closing opposition then needs to continue bringing new opposition constructives to the round and defeat or bring doubt onto the proposition's extension. So it's pretty much similar to what happens with the opening opposition, right? You have to engage with, the, with what the government said, but also um, differentiate yourself from your opening half. Um, both closings then need to provide an, a summary or what happened in the round that is convincing that it, and that is on target. And I think this is where a lot of the times you have to you have to listen to the whip speaker, right? Because um, especially when it comes to, I guess, like rookie debaters, a lot of the time um, the whip speakers are going to be like Asian parliamentary style whip in that they will whip for the whole bunch and not your own speaker. But at best that helps your opening. It doesn't really help the closing team. So you should be aware of what kind of summary the closing is able to provide in these cases. Um, yeah, moving on to the next slide. I'm going to talk about extensions because I think this is where, especially as a rookie, I was really frustrated because I thought I had said something very new and something that sounded different. But um, the feedback that I got for the beginning of my um, few BP tournaments was, oh, but you didn't have an extension. Oh, you didn't really sound different. So what do extensions mean? Extensions are can be divided into a couple of things. So first, they can be a totally new or independent argument or analysis. And this is what we call horizontal extensions, right? So for example, if in a round, the opening half focuses on an, in on an individual's state of mind and how they are going to change after policy is enacted, if I, as a closing half, um, provides a societal perspective or I guess like an institutional perspective that is going to be very very different from what the previous speaker said and that's going to count as an extension right um so these are things if you if you clearly have something that is different from the opening half that is going to be an extension right but more often than not because we are people who have similar backgrounds and who have gone through same similar experiences um 
a lot of our arguments are not going to be like mind-blowingly different, right? So in these cases, what you should do. Another thing you can do is as a, as a debater or as a judge, when you're trying to listen to um, what a closing half is doing, is see if they're providing a completely new insight to the debate. In that, even if it is based on the argument that the opening half introduced, if the closing is the one that is able to explain why that is important, then closing also has a contribution in this round. And that's how they're able to provide insight to what happened. Um, another thing is they can provide a new mechanism or model, which was not introduced by the opening, um, but is necessary in order for the arguments to happen. So if opening is a bad job in setting up the model, then the closing can say, hey, we think opening tried, but we're the ones that are able to show how this model actually works. And they can take credit for that extension. Um, you can also, again, if there is an argument that was touched upon by opening but wasn't really completed, then it can be the one that completes that argument. Just because opening says it first does not mean they always get credit. If that were the case, debates would always end in opening half. But it's the case in which how you're able to provide or how you're able to conclude that argument is important. And that's why um, for closing teams, if opening doesn't, doesn't do a good job in completing the argument, you're able to take that as an extension. Um, yeah, and then finally, and this is something that I like to do when I'm in closing, if there is a deadlock, so if two arguments from the goal, opening government and opening opposition are not really um, winning at this point, and they're just kind of there, then if I as closing comes up and says, hey, this is what happened in opening, if I am the one that is able to solve that deadlock, then open doesn't get credit, I should get credit and I should come first. And that's how you're able to provide an extension when it comes to understanding what happened in the opening half. So these are things that all count as extensions. And again, um, I think BP is very fun in that it's all about strategy, right? Because BP, even if you're admittedly not the team that knows the most, if you're the team that is able to provide that winning blow, then that is the one that is able to win. And I think that's why you should be able to selectively pick and choose and strategize your case if this is if this is what happens if you're a judge you should always have an open mind as to what kind of extensions closing is going to have but also be aware of how closing is going to frame it right so there are going to be cases in which it's pretty similar from the opening half but closing tries to make it sound different in that case what you should do is ask yourself can the case coming from closing half exist without the opening half if that is a case, that is the like, that is an extension. But if what closing said is solely dependent on what the opening half said, or is I guess better elaborated by the opening half, then it's going to be opening's contribution, and closing doesn't provide a very unique extension. So that's how you should you should understand extensions when it comes to judging. Um, it's also important to note that sometimes what teams are going to do is. When they try to bring new material, they're going to bring material that one is slightly different or or just very different from what the previous speaker said, or second, directly contradictory and cannot coexist with the model coming from the opening half. In that case, what should the judge do? It's very important for judges to understand, again, the consistency of a side, right? In that, closing teams should not contradict or be inconsistent with their opening halves. So even if, admittedly, the opening has presented a very weak case, closing cannot say, hey, I think opening was just really bad and like we, there's nothing they can do and therefore I'm going to just focus on us staying alive. They shouldn't do that or entirely dump the approach of the opening half. Closing should still roughly follow the general line of argumentations of the opening. So, but there are going to be cases, right, when your opening is just really, really bad and like they are just, they misunderstood the motion or they just um, prep their case wrong. <clears throat> and like the closing is like, I cannot win with this case and prevent, prevent a different case. So if there is a feeling among the adjudicators that the closing has dumped or backstabbed or knifed the opening team, the judge should then consider these criteria. Why, why did the closing dump the opening? Was it necessary for the closing to survive and not just um, jump on a second ship with the opening? And did dumping it lead to a better debate? So for example, um, this is something that I gave an example a lot of the times. Um, when I judged the school's round, there was a round about Africa TV. So about um, elementary school students 
um, having platforms on Africa TV, whether it should be banned. And um, a schools team came up to the podium and said, oh, we don't think Africa TV is good because Africa as a continent does not have a lot of resources or material and therefore um, it's not going to be very high quality TV. And, and even and, and in that round, even though there was an info slide about what Africa TV was, opening government just simply mis misunderstood, misread and misprepped the round. In that case, closing government can't simply say, oh, we think opening government is right. It is talking about the continent of Africa. But you should also not say, oh, we think opening government is, was really bad or like they're wrong. I think what you should say is, we think the better understanding or the right understanding of this debate is what was happening with the opposition if opposition talked about the actual platform in Korea and therefore we're going to engage with that ideals. So uh, I think it's always important for you to be competitive but not just like actively backlashing against the opening path. So that's how um, the judges should understand extensions and knifing. Um, yeah, um, I think then engagement is very I guess engagement happens a lot. Um, it, it's not always good or bad in the rounds, but it happens a lot because there are four teams and all four teams are going to try to engage with each other. Um, in those cases, engagement is different according to which team is able to ask um, what team. And I'm going to talk about a couple of ways in which engagement can happen and how you should evaluate that in a round. Um, sometimes there are going to be cases in which Three teams are talking about different, uh, uh, the same context, and one team is talking about a completely different context. We call them box and um, being boxed out. And in these cases, if this team is not able to engage with the context that is set by the other three teams, then they're more often than not going to be fourth. But it's also important to note that, as we said before, there is no such thing as an automatic fourth, right? What if I am CO and I am the only one that had a right understanding of the debate, but CG is does just chooses not to engage with me, and that's why I was boxed out. In these cases, if CO was able to explain why they are right and also able to explain why the other context doesn't, doesn't make sense, then they can be placed first because they're the team that has a clear understanding of what's supposed to happen. But again, these are things that have to be taken holistically about what happens in regards to the dynamics of all four teams. When it comes to engagements between the opening and closing half, what you should take is, what it, um, so engagement between the opening half and engagement between the closing half, meaning OG and OO and CG and CO. Um, because these teams are able to directly engage with one another, it's very, very important for them to do so in, in regards to rebuttals or in regards to POIs. So if OG, does not engage with OO, then sure, CG can do it, but CG is has to still engage with CO, right? So in that case, OG would lose out to C, o, CG when it comes to engagement. If OO tried to engage to OG, but OG didn't engage to OO, then they would lose out to OO in terms of engagement, right? So things like that. When it comes to the closing half engaging with the opening half, so how CG attacks OO and how CO attacks OG, um, there are two ways in which they can do it. One, if they can do it by solving the opening deadlock, as we said before. So if opening has a problem that is still remaining after the DLO speech and the closing government is the one that is able to solve that deadlock, then they're able to provide engagement to what happened in the opening half. Second, what closing half can do is if they're able to provide better rebuttals than their opening half, then they can take credit for engaging with that other team. So if OG is only able to provide shallow or like irrelevant arguments or rebuttals towards the opening opposition and CG is the one that is able to attack the core premises or conclusions, then CG's contribution or engagement is going to be higher than opening governments, right? So that's going to be what happens in regards to the closing to opening dynamics. Um, the more, I guess, difficult thing is opening to closing, right? Because especially for OG, once the VPN speech is over, the only way I am able to engage or speak in that round is through POIs. And that is why it is very, very important for opening teams to consistently ask POIs to their closing, but also be very strategic in how you word those POIs. So you guys know that POIs have a 15 second grace rule in that these POIs shouldn't go over 15 seconds. And that's true because I have a seven minute speech. Why should I let one person speak for 30 seconds or a minute? But it also means that a debater should always be very 
careful as to how they're going to word or how they're going to frame their POIs. So that's just what I tell people all the time. Don't stand up and just give an impromptu POI. Always write what you want to ask down and consistently ask POIs. So even if like um, the argument that is relevant to that POI has passed, you're still able to ask it when because if you think it's important. So this is how you would judge engagement when it comes to all four teams in that round. Um, yeah, a couple of important questions or questions that I've heard a lot from um, people when it comes to judging. So the first thing is, oh, I listened to the opposition, but opposition didn't have an alternative. They just said the gov is bad. Does that mean that they can still win? I thought opposition had it to have an alternative. Um, the short answer is no, they don't always have to have an alternative because um, debates always center or involve a proposal by the government bench to solve a certain problem or issue that both teams acknowledge. But the opposition role is not to provide an alternative, but simply to criticize the government's proposal. And in order for them to do this, they can have three, I guess, um, three choices. The first thing is, we don't think that problem is too severe and status quo is fine. So for example, if you're talking about progressive taxation and the government comes up and talks about how progressive taxation is bad for um, the top 1% or rich companies in Korea, then the opposition can simply say, hey, we think that is a problem, but that problem is fine because these people already make a lot of money on their own. And we would prefer to use that tax money for the more vulnerable or marginalized in our society. So that's one thing they can do. Um, but more often than not, um, a round or a motion will happen because the CAP thought it was a problem in our society and want to have it solved, right? So you are going to agree more often than not that there is a problem. In that case, what you can do is twofold. One, you can say, yes, it is a problem, but we have an alternative. And then that debate is going to proceed as a comparison of the two proposals, which solution is the better solution. However, there are going to be cases in which you've racked your brain or the opening team or the opposition bench has racked their brain, but they can't think of an alternative. Then what they can do is say, yes, there is a problem. Yes, status quo is bad, but it would be a lot worse with that alternative. So we would prefer to choose the comparatively better off status quo. Um, this is what we call a negative case. I have seen negative cases win, but um, it's also a bit unclear sometimes as to what then the opposition side wants. So I think just in terms of clarity, you would have to be very, very, I guess, uh, extensive as to the harms of what's going to happen under the government bench model. So as long as the opposition bench chooses either one of these three things, then they have a chance of going against what the government side wants. The one thing that opposition bench cannot do is say, yes, we agree with the model, because then there wouldn't be a debate, because there wouldn't be sides arguing for different sides of emotion. So yeah, as to oppositions having an alternative, it's not, uh, they don't always have to have one. It's, it is not mandated. Second, um, what happens when people go against the rule of good sportsmanship in role fulfillment? So these are things where, for example, um, there are times where people understand that this motion is supposed to happen in a certain way, but they squirrel the motion because they think it's easier for them to win. So they lessen their burden or they time set or place set their motion, or they talk about things that are very unfair to the other side. What happens then? In, even in these cases, it shouldn't lead to an automatic loss or penalization as we have been beforehand. But obviously, if that team squirrels the motion and the other team is trying to be as fair as possible, they're more likely going to lose out in things like an engagement or um, content of the arguments anyways. So you try to be, I think, like in that case, it is unlikely that the team that scrolls wins, but that does not mean that once you hear a scrolled argument, that you should simply give them the loss. Um, other arguments of violations of good sport, sportsmanship include things like knifing, if closing is blatantly going against the opening half, um, if the OG sets an insufficient or unfair definition, or if the closing has a complete rehashing of their arguments. So these things, again, um, if they happen, are not going to lead to very fun rounds to watch, but that does not mean that one team should simply get forth because these things happened. 
Um, yeah. The next point, so as, as of now, I've talked about how you reach a verdict. I'm going to talk next about what happens when you've reached the verdict and now it's your time to give feedback. So um, this is, again, a template or guideline for people who want to become a good judge. If you have um, judged a lot or if you have a certain set of standards that you want to implement after you start a judging, that is fine. And a lot of the judges that I am close with don't follow this either. But this, again, at least guarantees you that you are not a bad judge, I would say. Um, so yeah, so this is what I do actually. I would indicate how the feedback process is going to proceed. So I would say something like, hello, um, welcome back to the round. Thank you for the round. I will give you an overall, I guess, impression of the round, then move on to the verdict, then justify my rankings. Um, and then I'll talk about constructive or individual feedback. Um, so yeah, um, I don't really like jumping straight into the verdict. I like to talk about what happens um, that can affect all four teams. So I think all four teams need to do a better job and engagement or rule fulfillment or things like that. Um, and then when I give the verdict, I would do something like oh, it's an opening half or it's a closing half or it's a up bench, golf bench, a long diagonal, short diagonal win. And then I will give the rankings, right? Um, after that, what I would do is I would justify my rankings from bottom to top. So I would give um, a comparison of adjacent teams. Um, some people ask me, but isn't it better if you're able to compare all four teams? So why OG, how OG did compare to OO, CG, and CO? Yes, it's in an ideal world, that would be true, but um, it gets very, very messy. And also there are time constraints. And also um, there's no, like, I guess, like there's no reason for you to compare the first and the fourth team. If you're able to explain why the third is better than fourth and second is better than third and first is better than second, right? So that's why I would just start from the bottom and explain what the team that ranked above the team that ranked below did better. So, and that, and I would continue on from that. Um, so in that case, what I would do is I would provide what the losing team failed to do and how the winning team was able to do. Because it's always important to know that the losing team is more interested to know why they lost compared to the winning team trying to find out why they won. And it's a sad reality, but teams that lost are going to be a bit more, or I guess like angry and like rightfully so, right? Because they wanted to do well. So um, I try to explain in a nice way, but explain firmly as to why this team um, was not able to outrank the others when it comes to these rounds. Um, but always try to be nice. I think like one of my pet peeves is if there are incredibly rude judges, I just don't understand why you would do that. Um, I, I try to be nice as possible. That just always helps people like you more or like give you get better scores anyways. But I would always say what um, the team did good, but what they weren't able to do at the end, which is why the team that is ranked above them was able to do so. So yeah, I would compare the adjacent teams. And then finally, um, I would ask if there are any teams or um, debaters that want constructive or individual feedback. Um, again, constructive feedback are things like, what would I have done if I were a debater? Or what are arguments that um, didn't come up in the round, but could have come up? Um, it's very important for people to understand that these constructive arguments are just constructive and had no impact on how you judge the round. Because you should not have um, reasonings like, oh, you lost the round because you weren't able to give this argument. That's, that's, the, that's how you think a round should happen. That does not mean that that round actually happened in that way. So it's very important for, um, yeah, for you to, um, I'm sorry, for you to do it in that way. But wait, something popped up. I need to. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, something popped up. Um, yeah. So that is what's going to happen when it comes to these um comparisons of ad adjacent teams. Um, and then moving on to um the next thing is. I always, as a judge, when you're giving oral feedback, try not to intervene in a round, which means don't give um, debaters an impression that you gave them a fourth no matter what they did, or you gave one team a certain score because you like them more or you like their arguments more. And that's going to be a complaint that a lot of debaters have if they think that a judge intervened. And as we said before, all judges should be 
unbiased from an average re reasonable person. Um, the easiest way for you to do this is be careful of your language. Don't use subjective terms like persuasive or better or sounded nice. Always show them what happened in regards to OG said this, OO said this. In these cases, what OO said would happen more or would affect the majority of people and therefore OO's case is more applicable and that's why OO is over OG, things like this. Um, again, when it comes to constructive feedback, be careful of how you phrase your comments, right? So um, I, I always start by saying this had no impact on the verdict, but had I been opposition, I would have done these things or vice versa. Um, yeah. What should I do during the debate? And this is where I feel like a lot of the times people, um, judges are overwhelmed because they try to do everything as soon as um, up whip ends. And that's just, you, you don't have a lot of time to reach that verdict. So I always try to do these things during the, during the round. So first, I always try to give speaker scores while listening to the debate. So if I set up the PM as 75, which is average score, and I think that LO was a bit better than, D, um, than PM, than 76. If the PM was a little worse than 74. So I would compare and comparatively give the scores and adjust on the scores as the round, and as the round proceeds. Um, I would also rank the teams after that team has ended. So after opening, I would write whether OG won or lost to OO. Sure, this might change, but this helps me get an initial understanding of how the round happens. Um, after, the, after each closing, I would place the closing in the ranking. So if CG was clearly better than opening half, CG would be over opening. But if CG was better than OG but not OO, then they would go between the opening. If CO was the best out of all four teams, then CO would be first. If after listening to CO, I'm not sure what they did, and I don't think they were able to win over any other team, and they're fourth, then that would be how the ranking is happening. Um, you can go over your notes, of course, after the round is over, but having this initial ranking helps you helps you change the scores instead of starting from a blank slate. Um, yeah, I've already talked about the PM scores. Um, yeah, so that's what I do during the round. I try to have my initial verdict and I try to have the speaker scores because always note that initial verdicts are, go are going to be different from um, the verdict at the end. It, it could be different, right? As, as um, After you have a discussion with your panel, if your panel is able to convince you to change, that can always change. But you should always have an initial, I think this is how the round went before you enter that discussion. Um, yeah. Um, before I end, I'm going to talk a little bit about notes taking because I think that's something that can help you guys not only in terms of judging, but also in terms of debating. Um, the most important thing for note taking, and this is where I feel like um, even when I was a rookie debater, this is the one thing that people had complimented me on. So like, they're like, oh, I don't think you had impact or I don't think your arguments really made sense, but at least you were organized. So organization is the easiest thing for you to improve upon. And I think it starts from things like, um, so what I do when I'm a judge is I would fold an A4 piece of paper into four so that I'm able to jot down notes for opening and closing and compare the two sheets. Um, even if I'm debating, what I would do is I would um, do that same thing and I would write down my notes and I would then write down my POIs or rebuttals according to those notes. Um, it's always important for you to have neat, um, if not neat, um, like legible handwriting so you don't get confused by your notes. I do know that people speak fast. I do know that there's a lot of information to proceed, but it is very important for you to have organized um, notes that you write down because otherwise when you look back, you're not really able to understand what this person has said. Um, so yeah, organization and neat handwriting is like the basics. But second, and this is where I feel like it's a like a trick that I learned um, as the years went by, is I would color code my notes, but I'm able to understand what this part is and how it fits in with the rest of the speech. So for most of my notes, I would write it in black. So if there is like, if they're just like simple arguments, I would write it in black. But if it's POIs or engagement or rebuttal or things where teams actively um, went back and forth, then I would write it in blue or I would circle it in blue. So, and I would like write arrows that would like point against each other because that helps me understand how those teams interacted. If um, 
OO said something that is really, really important. And this is something that had to come out in this round, then I would put a red on it and I would put a star on it. Um, vice versa, if there is a contradiction within the OG speech, and this is something that, that even an average reasonable person can understand, then I would write it in a red and write contradiction on top of it. So these are things where I think like your notes in the end have to be like a visual representation of what happened in the round. And these things help you understand. Um, when it comes to judging or when it comes to you, I guess, um, understanding what the other person said, try to write down exactly what they said. One, because it leaves less room for misinterpretation. Um, I do know a couple of very esteemed judges that would write their notes in Korean, but for me that's a bit counterintuitive because the process of listening to English and translating it into Korean and then translating it back into English is a very subjective process. So I would just write down verbatim what that person has said. But second, it also allows you to show the debaters that you are not interventionist. So if a, t if a debater comes up to you and says, but hey, I talked about this in the round. Why didn't you give me credit for that argument? Then you can read back what they said to them, right? So no, you didn't say that in the way that you just said it to me now. What you actually said in the round is, quote, and that's very different from what you intended. So this might be what you meant, but this wasn't what you said. So things like that. You're able to provide a little bit more, um, I guess, persuasion to what happened in the round. Um, yeah. That's it for my lecture. I hope you guys have an understanding of